You've got sports cars, then you've got supercars, then you've got hypercars. And at the top tier of hypercars, there are two manufacturers that have been duking it out back and forth to build a production vehicle with the highest top speed. Two companies that come from countries that aren't really known for high-speed cars, Sweden and France. Which of these two companies makes the faster, more desirable, more just plain better hypercar? It's Bugatti and Koenigsegg. We're comparing both of them on top speed, attainability, track performance, pedigree, and the future. We've got a lot to cover on these two manufacturers, so let's get into round one. If the facts are gonna do the talking, there's no better place to start than with top speed. But to understand the top speed battle between these two cars, we first need to talk about the record itself. To officially hold the record of fastest production car, you need an independent test to be conducted on an unmodified production model of the car where it makes the run twice in opposite directions on the same stretch of road. The record is the average of those two runs, and this accounts for any wind or incline that might give the car an advantage. In 1993, the record was set by McLaren with the F1. The official top speed was 221 miles an hour, but many people know the number to be 240 miles an hour. 240 miles an hour was achieved, but with a modified rev limiter. 221 was enough to get the F1 the record, but 240 is the number that people remember. And that's part of the game, honestly. The reason to go for a record like this is to get people talking about the car. So, 240 was the number to shoot for, and Bugatti made an attempt that same year with the EB110 SS. You may not know the EB110 SS because it only managed 218 miles an hour. I mean, psh, 218? How do you even look at yourself in the mirror, EB110 SS? <laughs> Come on. Seriously though, if I was even in the passenger seat of a car going 218 miles an hour, my face would melt off. That's a football field every second. So, Bugatti's attempt in 1993 was a bust, but what about Koenigsegg? Well, they were still a year away from becoming a company. Over the next 10 years, both manufacturers were head down in development. In 2005, both companies had badass machines to try and make their run. Koenigsegg entered the ring with their 800 horsepower twin supercharged CCR. It reached a top speed at the Nardo ring of 241 miles per hour. But the actual record set that year was by Bugatti with the quad turbocharged 987 horsepower EB 16.4 Veyron at 253 miles per hour. It shattered the record set by the F1. It broke that 240 mile per hour barrier. It smashed through the 250 mile per hour barrier, which some said was impossible at the time. Can you imagine how Christian von Koenigsegg must have felt knowing he'd been beaten to the top speed record? As the years went by with the Veyron holding the record, Bugatti was not asleep at the wheel. In 2010, they attempted the top speed record again with a new version of the Veyron, the Super Sport. It had over 1,100 horsepower. It stole the record from its older brother with a 267 mile per hour top speed. While Bugatti was celebrating though, Koenigsegg had their nose to the grindstone. And Bugatti was also facing legitimacy issues because even though they had reached 267 miles per hour, the production cars were limited to 258 for safety reasons. But it didn't really matter. As long as they held the world record in some way, that top number was the new benchmark. The bar had been raised again. Would Koenigsegg reach it? In 2017, they made an attempt with the Agera RS. It produced 1,341 horsepower from a twin turbo V8. And that was enough to propel the RS to 277.8 miles per hour. The Agera RS is the fastest production road car. But what about unofficially? Bugatti spooled up the four turbos of their Chiron Supersport 300 Plus and pushed the car to 304 miles per hour. 
This is a stupidly fast car, but since the car isn't technically in production yet, it can't hold a production car record. The test was also only conducted in one direction, so the results still aren't legitimate. But Bugatti must be pretty confident that it'll hit 300 plus. I mean, they named it the 300 plus. So with all the numbers and stats in one place, it's time to score up round one. Both these companies make insane cars, and I'd love to even be in the same zip code as one of these beasts. For holding the current record, for challenging the record every step of the way, I'm gonna give Koenigsegg four points. But for using speed to become a world-recognized name, for having the balls to go for a record that you already had, and for having potentially made a 300-plus mile-per-hour car, I'm gonna give Bugatti five points in this category. Koenigsegg and Bugatti make their top speed contenders that you may know about, but just how hard is it to get your hands on one of those? It's not as easy as, say, a Huracan or a 488. You wouldn't find these cars on racing junk or bring a trailer, and if you type Bugatti into Facebook Marketplace, your phone will straight up laugh at you. Used Veyrons are listed for at least a million dollars in any trim. CCRs, at least a million as well. So right off the bat, we're talking about some high numbers here. At the top end, the numbers are absolutely insane. Here's a Koenigsegg one-to-one -one listed for $7 million. And for Bugatti, they announced last year the Cento DHE. They're only making 10 of them, and they're $10 million each. If all you're looking for is the badge, though, you might be in luck with Bugatti. They've been in business for over 100 years. And while their Le Mans winners like the Type 10 are more expensive than their modern cars, you can find some outliers like the Type 40 Roadster that can be picked up for a cool 200 grand. You wouldn't have uh, power steering, AC, a radio, a starter motor, or windows, but you could tell people you have a Bugatti. Let's pretend for a second that money is no object. You're independently wealthy. You've got a house with a 10-car garage, all the sneakers you could want, no student or credit card debt. You can maintain a savings account for more than six months. You're not regretting that theater degree, you don't have to sell plasma to afford track days. Sorry, I got distracted. If the price tag was just a number, which would be more attainable then? You can't just walk into a dealership, can you? Well, actually, you kind of can. With Bugatti, they recognize that the fans give the brand strength and value. At the showroom in London, you can come in and meet the current Bugatti Chiron. They'll let you take photos and even touch the $3 million beast. So while you can get up close and personal with these cars as a fan, the purchasing process is a little different. Both companies reference a tailor-made experience when it comes to buying a car. GT driver Pasin Lathoris said it was a six-month process to get his Agera RS. And it wasn't just sitting and waiting. It was trips to the factory, meetings with art designers, approvals of each piece as it was put on the car. These cars are a huge spend, so it makes sense that you aren't treated like you're financing a Kia Sportage. If you can't wait six months or you don't care about choosing the color dye that gets woven into your carbon fiber, you can always look at the used market. If you want to buy a Veyron, you'll have some slim pickings because only 450 were ever made. On top of that, the Chiron production run has only been 200 so far. So what about Koenigsegg? If you prefer the top speed record holder, the Agera RS, you are looking for one in 25 units that were ever made. Seriously, if you add up the production runs of the CC8S, the CCR, the CCX, the CCXR, the CCXR Special Edition, the Agera, the Agera R, the Agera S, the Agera RS, and the one-to-one, -one, you still end up with less than 150 Koenigseggs. Koenigsegg is setting out to make some larger production runs, though. Their four-seater Jamera is slated to have a production run of 300 units. So that's the info on how to get these cars into your garage. Now, for scoring a category like this, usually we would say the more attainable, the better. But for cars like this, exclusivity is part of what makes it desirable. No matter what the performance numbers, half the people that bought a Veyron or CCR would think twice if their neighbor had one too. With low production runs that sell out before they've even been driven, and for having a century's worth of classic cars that still hold six-digit values or more, I'm gonna give Bugatti four points in this category. Koenigsegg, however, is newer, more exclusive, and slower to deliver, so that makes them uber rare. 
but I'm only gonna give them three points. Because honestly, they overshot the exclusivity thing a bit. They're so exclusive that people don't know they exist. And if there's one thing I know about people that wanna show off the money they spent, it's that they want you to know how much money they spent. So Bugatti is holding a solid two point lead heading into round three. But will Koenigsegg make a comeback? Let's find out. We know these cars can go fast in a straight line and sometimes even in a slightly curved line. But what about on track? Are these cars really built for one thing and one thing only? Well, Bugatti has some race wins under their belt. Bugatti won the Monaco Grand Prix and the 24 Hours of Le Mans twice. You know, in the 30s. Bugatti hasn't had a true race car since 1956. Koenigsegg has only been around since 1994 and to this day have no manufacturer race wins. So competition stats are out, but that doesn't mean that no one has taken these cars to a track. Evo Magazine took the Koenigsegg CCX to the Nürburgring in 2008, and it lapped the green hell in seven minutes and 33 seconds. And honestly, that's not a great time for the money you're paying. At those speeds, you're likely to get beat by a stock R35. For Bugatti though, it's even worse. The Veyron put down a seven minute 40, making it just as fast as a bone stock M5. But the Veyron and the CCX are designed for straight line speed. What about other models? Well, Bugatti has been kind of quiet about their Nürburgring lap times since the Veyron. They sent the Veyron Supersport around in 2012, but never posted a time, which can only mean one thing, that it's slower than the base model. Koenigsegg, on the other hand, has put some effort into track-minded cars. The Koenigsegg 1 to 1 was designed from the ground up to shatter the Nürburgring production car lap record. During construction, the projections were targeting a lap time under seven minutes flat. That would blow Bugatti away. The 1 to 1 can definitely run a faster lap time than any that Bugatti have set. But exactly how much faster, we don't yet know. In 2015, a Nissan GTR crashed at the Nürburgring, killing a bystander, and the track closed itself to hot laps for the rest of the year. Koenigsegg came back in 2016, but on their hot lap, they also crashed, and the 1 to 1 was only just rebuilt last year. The 1 to 1 did run a 2 minute 32.1 around Spa, which is the fastest lap for a production car. Koenigsegg say it could have been faster, but noise restrictions at the track stopped them from running for another flying lap. So Koenigseggs are definitely faster than Bugatti's on track, and that 2016 crash was just a fluke, right? Well, not really. In 2014, while testing an Agera mule car with one-to-one -one parts, Koenigsegg also crashed at the Nürburgring. And in 2008, a CCX was crashed on Top Gear by the Stig. The Stig. If the Stig can't keep one of these on track, you can't either. Neither company has a motorsport division to really look into that reliability. Koenigsegg did build a CCX to enter into the GT1 class of Le Mans, but it was denied entry for being too light and for not meeting the homologation standards of 350 units. It was too race car to be a race car. Honestly, I think this is one of the stupidest rules the FIA has ever enforced, but luckily they'll be making up for it soon with a new hypercar class in WEC starting this year. Koenigsegg and Bugatti have yet to officially enter, but in a few years we'll see Chiron's and Yesco's up against McLaren Senna's and Aston Martin Valkyries. With Bugatti setting less than impressive lap times that can be beaten without even spending a hundred grand, I'm gonna only give it two points on track. For Koenigsegg, they are setting track records and chasing some amazing performance numbers other than top speed. So I'd like to give them a perfect score, but they've got too many crashes staining their reputation and it's getting in the way of them showing their true performance. So I'm gonna knock it down to four points, which if you've been paying attention means we are all tied up, but it isn't over yet. We've still got two rounds and the next one is officially a doozy. Sure, the numbers and stats on these cars are cool, but it's tough to justify them if the badge doesn't mean anything. In this round, we are looking at the pedigree and heritage of these two companies, and boy, they couldn't be any more different. Bugatti was started in 1909. Koenigsegg was started in 1994. Koenigsegg is independently owned, while Bugatti is owned by Volkswagen. 
The Bugatti badge is known around the world. Even though Koenigsegg has made cars faster than the Veyron, and so have many other companies at this point, the Veyron was the first hypercar. It was the first over 250 miles an hour. It was the first car with the million dollar price tag. It approached speed in a different way than any other car. The body design showed you that you could achieve speed without the sleek lines of a Ferrari or a Porsche, but instead with brute force. The car name that no one knew that had been around for a hundred years was now becoming a household name. Hell, it was in rap music. Can you imagine how a Tori Bugatti would have felt to hear, I woke up in a new Bugatti? Probably a little disappointed. There's kind of not much more to that song. But the point is that everyone from Rick Ross to Ross Braun knows and respects the name Bugatti. And in the classic car scene, Bugatti has even more going for it. Just look at the Type 57 SC. Apart from being drop dead gorgeous, it also sold for $30 million. Koenigseggs may be fast and they may be elusive, sure, but they don't have the history that Bugatti does. There is one little thing though that makes certain Koenigseggs really, really cool. If you're lucky enough to ever see one in person, look for a little ghost symbol in the stitching or etched into the Lexan. It's only on cars that were built at the Koenigsegg headquarters, a headquarters that used to be an airbase for Swedish fighter pilots. They'd take off in the early morning mist when locals around the base could only hear them. So they began to call them ghosts. Jet pilots adopted that as their symbol. And when Koenigsegg took over the building, they asked if the car could carry the ghost symbol as a sign of honor to their countrymen and fellow seekers of speed. When you boil it down, heritage is just a good story about where you came from. And to have a tale with jets, ghosts, and patriotism is a pretty cool way to get people to buy into your company. Koenigsegg has that one little tidbit of history and information, which is cool, but it's not enough to really build a brand around. So I'm giving them one point in this round. With Bugatti's long history, as well as the splash they've made in the present day, I'm gonna give them four points, which means that Bugatti is back in the lead. But if Bugatti has the edge in the past and in the present, what about in the future? Both Bugatti and Koenigsegg are at the cutting edge of development. Bugatti has fit more cylinders and more turbos into a car-shaped package than ever before, and Koenigsegg has put out stupid amounts of horsepower while weighing less than a Miata. But what do these manufacturers have planned for the future? At first glance, both companies are gonna do what you would expect. Bugatti is going for a faster production car top speed record with the Chiron Supersport 300 plus. Koenigsegg is hoping to chase down the Nürburgring fastest lap time with the Yesco. That target has moved since they last tested though, with the McLaren P1 clocking a six minute and 43 second lap around the Nürburgring. So that's it, right? The two companies are gonna continue to push where they want to succeed. And that's just it. With Bugatti, that's kind of the case. They might have some secret projects they've not told anyone about, but the 300 plus seems to be the only thing on their horizon. For Koenigsegg, however, they are not done. Not by a long shot. In addition to the track-focused Yesco, they are making the Yesco Absolute, which is designed for straight line speed. It's got less drag than an F1 car with almost double the horsepower. It's being built to steal the record right out from under the 300 plus. With enough space, it can theoretically reach 330 miles per hour. It has an all new gearbox designed in-house by Koenigsegg that is a nine speed that shifts so fast, they call it the LST or light speed transmission. Speed and lightness are the name of the game for the Yesco. It even has carbon fiber wheels that are half the weight of the tires it's wrapped in. But that's not all. Koenigsegg also announced the Gemera. It's a three cylinder twin turbo with four seats. That makes 1700 horsepower! It uses three electric motors as well. So the two liter three banger only has to make 600 horsepower, which on its own is insane. It's mid engined and all wheel drive, but it can still fit four six foot people and all their luggage. Four engines, 
four seats, four wheel drive. This is like the Voltron of cars. The Yesco and the Jamera are two amazing cars, but let's not downplay the Chiron Supersport 300 Plus too much. While the Yesco Absolute may indeed be faster than the 300 Plus, Bugatti has already done their run. They've proven what that car can do, and it's just a small formality that they don't have the official record yet. For breaking the 300 mile per hour barrier, potentially setting another world record, but not really giving us anything to look forward to, I'm gonna give Bugatti two points in this category. And with the Yesco going after two huge records in two different configurations, and with the Jamera being the world's first GT hypercar, Koenigsegg stands to score a lot of points here, but not five. It's not a perfect round, I wish it was, maybe if Koenigsegg had tipped the scales with one more model, or they had committed to racing in the WEC hypercar class, I could have given it to them, but they didn't go all the way. So I'm gonna give them four points, which means that Bugatti is our winner. Boy, was it close though. Koenigsegg threw some great punches, but they're just a little too new and a little too unlucky to really sit at that top spot yet. Thanks for watching. Be sure to follow Donut on Instagram and Twitter at Donut Media. If you're a Koenigsegg owner that wants to show me that I'm wrong, just pick me up outside and we'll talk about it up PCH. There was a leaf blower outside there uh, where they were streaming from on Monday and just in the middle of the show, like nothing we can do about it. We're live. <laughs>